Okay, you've just bought yourself a new to you snowmobile and you're brand new to the sport. So how do you make your first real trip successful? Well today, I'm gonna take a look at that and maybe pass on some hints that I've learned over my 10 plus years snowmobiling to make your first trip really, really fun. So grab yourself something warm to drink, sit back and enjoy Dino's Tinker Shed. Snowmobile season's here. I love it. You know, one of my favorite parts of snowmobiling is actually planning the trips. The routes that I take and the different things that you're gonna see are really exciting. Now, if you're really truly new to snowmobiling, this is your first trip, there's probably a few things that you wanna think about as you plan your trip. Now, the first one is keep it simple the first time around. So try not to do a five-day multi-route trip for your first outing. There's a lot of things that can go wrong with snowmobiling. As simple as not having the right clothing, not having your sled set up to fit you correctly, or you could even run into mechanical issues, especially if your sled is a used sled that you've purchased. You may not know fuel ranges, you may not uh, have all the right spark plugs available, things like that. So if you keep it simple to a single one day trip the first time out, it's probably a better option. Now, with that, I would keep the trip close to home. So maybe an hour to an hour and a half drive from your house is probably good. And if you live near the trails, well, it might even be less than that. This way, if you do run into problems, you're a phone call away from somebody coming out and helping you. Now, when you do start to plan the trip, there's lots of great options available. The interactive online guide here for the Ontario Federation of Snowmobiles is a great choice. It shows you all kinds of information over and above just the trails, but most of that information is available on the paper maps as well. And sometimes I just like looking at the paper maps because you can see the entire area that you're going to ride in in a one snapshot sort of view. It's really, really fun. So when you get to the planning stages, you're gonna to wanna to look at a few things. Probably the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is pick a destination to start from. So your, your launch point. And that really needs to have really good parking available for you. And most of the clubhouses allow you to park there, but sometimes it's not all that much parking. So if you can, Pick sort of a, a town or a location that maybe has multiple launch sites available to you in case you show up there and there's just no parking left in one of the parking spots, you can switch to another one. Similar to that, you're going to want to pick an area where fuel is readily available and it's available in pretty much any direction that you choose to ride. If the snowmobile is new to you, you're not going to know what your maximum range is. And that's something you learn over the course of a number of rides. So having a lot of different fuel stops within an area that you're riding gives you a bit of peace of mind in knowing that you're not going to run out of fuel, that you can find fuel in different locations if you need to. Similar to that is the maps show you places to eat. Now there's always places off of the map but the map tends to show you and the in the trail guide for that matter it shows you places that are very close to the trail they're adjacent to the trail you can ride right up to them and most often if they're on the map or they're on the interactive guide they welcome sledders so they'll often have a place where you can park your snowmobile somewhere other than the main parking lot they usually have racks to put your helmets and your coats on so they dry up 
and they love to see snowmobilers. They'll be really excited to know where you've come from and want to share that experience that you're having and make your day even better. You can also look at things like restrooms. So it's a funny thing, but when you're out on the trail and you need to use the washroom, uh, the, the interactive trail guide will actually tell you uh, where there are outhouses along the way, things like that. So it's just something that's fun to plan when you do plan your route. Um, another good tip is to engage with people who are already snowmobiling. Now chances are if you're getting into snowmobiling, um, somebody that you're talking with is sort of telling you, you should try this sport out. See if they'll take you on your first ride or maybe there's some friends that you've met online that will meet you and take you out and about. Now good guidance like that is really beneficial because often people can tell you a great place to say start your first trip with all of those amenities that we've talked about and they might come out and actually guide you and give you some tips on riding. So see if you can buddy up with a few people and honestly riding with other people is so fun because when you do stop uh, to have a bit of food or something like that um, you're going to want to talk about how much fun you're having or maybe you have questions about something like how is it you're able to corner the way you corner things like that and if they know it's your first time they're going to stop frequently to make sure you're doing good they're going to keep an eye on you and uh, if you're getting cold they're going to take you to a place to have a, a break so after you've planned your trip you kind of know where you're going um, before you actually head out there's a couple things you really should do so you get up you you've had your breakfast you're, you maybe even have the sleds burbling away out there warming up um, check the trail conditions for that day on the interactive trail map those trails change from yellow to green to red very quickly and the last thing you want to do is have a route planned out get out there and realize that one of the trails that you were planning on taking is now closed and you have to reroute on the fly. So it, you know, it pays to have a quick look, it takes maybe five minutes to, to fire up the app and have a look, but it can save you a lot of anxiety out on the trail if you're getting low on fuel because you planned a certain route and now you can't make that route because one of the, the actual trails has been closed overnight. And the last thing with planning is before you actually head out, try to let someone know where you're heading for that day. So when I go out um, with, with my son-in-law or my brother-in-law, I'll text my wife and say, you know what, we're heading out today from Sudbury, we're leaving Azilda, we're taking the Moose Loop in a counterclockwise rotation and we should be back to the hotel around four o'clock. If I'm not back by seven, and you can't get a hold of me or I haven't texted you, you may want to think about making a phone call to the authorities. Um, that way she has the information roughly where we were heading, what time we left, what direction we were going in. So the local authorities and snowmobile clubs could go and give you a hand. So that's a little bit about the planning. It really is a fun part of, of snowmobiling because you can sort of visualize where you're heading. Um, and it, and it really does start early on, even before the season begins. So good, let's look at the next thing. Now, if you're new to snowmobiling, it probably means you're new to your snowmobile. Part of having a successful first trip is understanding your sled. So at the very bare minimum, you should read through the operator's manual if you've never ridden one of these things before, or take a course on how to ride them. But at the very, very bare minimum, you should be able to change and adjust your belt height for the drivetrain and carry a spare belt with you. These things do disintegrate occasionally. Now, if you've never changed a belt before, especially on some of the older sleds, it can be a little bit tricky, so you should probably practice it before you get out on the trail. And before you leave the house to head out onto the trail, give your sled a good inspection. Check all your carbides, make sure they're in place, the steering is nice and tight. And again, uh, this video is really about people that maybe have never snowmobiled before. Go through the systems and learn how they work. 
How do you turn on the heated grips and adjust them? You know, if your dashboard has multiple displays, are they set to what you want? Mine, I always have the, uh, the speed and the engine temperature is what I like to watch when I ride. But when I bought this sled and the first time I took it up north, I was really, really excited. I unloaded the sled, it was burbling away, and we drove about a half a kilometer down the road to get fuel. So I shut, the, I shut the sled off, everybody filled up, just couldn't wait to get on the trail, and I couldn't get the sled started. Everybody else left, they were all down the trail. I couldn't get my sled to start. Now, what it turned out to be was, my old Polaris was pretty simple. It had a key, you put it in the ignition, and you started the sled in the way you went. Now, it had a kill switch, but I rarely used it. Now, these modern uh, Skidoo sleds basically have uh, three steps in the process. They have a, a kill switch, push button up and down kill switch. They have the desk key, which is a proximity key. It snaps on, the, on a ball and the system reads that the key is close to it. And then you push the thumb button and it starts more like a motorcycle. Well, I had pulled off the desk key and put it in my pocket because someone might steal my brand new sled when I'm away for two minutes paying for gas. I forgot to put it back onto the ball. So what would happen is I'd push the starter button, the dash would light up, but the sled wouldn't start. I was flicking the, the kill switch up and down and pushing the button and I thought, man, I just spent a lot of money on a sled that's unreliable. I then realized I got to put the key on, put the desk key on the ball, it fired right up and away we went. So even someone who's been snowmobiling for a lot of years can make mistakes like that. You feel kind of funny, but honestly, take the time to read your manual, understand everything, make sure all your fluids are topped up, especially if it's a two stroke, make sure you keep the reservoir filled up with two stroke oil and away you go. Now on the back of the snowmobile, I carry a Lynx bag here. And this Lynx bag carries everything I'm gonna need for the day's trip and maybe things that might arise that I'm not really expecting. So the kit's kind of divided into four general groups. There's items for redundancy over here. There's items for repairs that may need to be done. There is items for safety and survival here, and then there's navigation over here. And I wanna take a look at each one of these components individually with you. Now, these are gonna vary a little bit. This is what I carry. My son-in-law carries very similar things on his snowmobile, as does my brother-in-law, um, but they're gonna vary a little bit um, depending on how you ride, where you ride, and, and what type of maintenance or equipment that your snowmobile may need. But I'll show you roughly what I carry as a basic kit. I'm usually adding things to this over the course of the winter months, but uh, this is where I sort of start off from. Okay, let's take a look first at redundancy. So on this corner here is really what I would call redundancy. So for instance, this is my main key for my snowmobile. I always carry a spare in a pocket in my snow pants that I don't access very often. That way, if I happen to lose this when I'm coming out of the restaurant, maybe I paid my bill, you lose your desk key, well, you always have a backup. Now this green one here is a limited key. Um, which means the sled would only do 70 kilometers an hour. I actually have a second gray key that I keep all the time in my snow pants. It never leaves and it's always there in case I need it. Now the same thing goes for my vehicle. If my son-in-law's towing, uh, he carries an extra key. If I'm towing, I carry an extra key. And believe it or not, I give this key to my son-in-law and he carries that in his coat. This way, if again, I drop it uh, or lose it, he actually has a second set of keys. Um, you know, that way he, you know, he can get in the truck if something happens, someone got hurt, he could ride back and get the truck and not have to worry about not having a set of keys. And the same thing with the trailers. He's got a, 
Well, he's got a set to my tinker shed, the snowmobile, just about the house, everything. My son-in-law and daughter have keys for all that. Um, I also carry some plastic bags to store things like cell phones and stuff like that in case um, I lose the ones that I normally store them in. And I always keep an assortment of different cables that I may need to charge my phone. I carry a plug with me and I carry an extra heater for my visor in case I lose it. And all of those tuck nice and tidily into little semi-small packages like this that you can get. So that's kind of my redundancy philosophy. Um, it's basically what if. Now the other thing I'm gonna mention right now is I always keep a second set of insurance and ownership um, in, in on the snowmobile. And the reason I do that is um, I forgot my insurance one season before you could actually put it onto your phone. Um, had to cut the trip short because I didn't have proof of insurance. Now, it goes into this tail bag. The tail bag comes in every single night, so I'm not worried about having a set of insurance inside of there, and I always keep one on my arm, so when you get stopped by the OPP or local trail owners, you can pull it out and it's easy to use. I always keep a base camp basically of tools out in the truck or in the trailer. And again, my son-in-law or my brother-in-law always carry some as well. So we have a fairly substantial, robust tools in case some major catastrophic thing happens, we can usually fix it inside of the trailer itself. But when you're out on the trail, you do want to carry some rudimentary tools. Now for me, zip ties, I always carry a pack of zip ties with me. These have gotten me out of a pinch many times. And one thing that's good to carry, or I find it's good to carry, is this silicone non-sticky tape. Now this, you can stretch around um, your liquid-cooled hoses. It will seal them up and get you off the trail. It's relatively inexpensive. It doesn't carry up a lot of space, and I, I carry that with me. I always carry a couple flashlights. These ones are magnetic, so they can stick on steel-tunneled um, snowmobiles. And I wrap those. I carry two of them and I wrap them in a rag here so I always have a rag and it protects those as they bounce around in the tail bag. And what I do is I will secure them with these Velcro stretch straps here. It keeps, uh, keeps everything together and these stretch straps can sometimes come in handy for securing things onto your sled. Now I have a small quarter drive socket set that I carry and an assortment of small tools. If you're a Polaris owner, you're gonna have one of these here. You're gonna have uh, 5 8 and 9 16 if, um, if you're like me that rides a Skidoo, you're gonna probably carry a couple metric tools, um, a crescent wrench, small pair of vice grips, things like this. This isn't, this isn't your shop tools. These are to get you out of a pinch. Uh, a razor knife, very, very handy, and of course, uh, the jump pack for the starter that goes all fits in here and it all goes inside that tail bag. So you can add or subtract whatever you want, you know, add screwdrivers, things like that. Um, you want this to be robust enough that it's actually useful, but not so heavy that you, you just won't bother to take it along. So you're going to have to make some decisions yourself in terms of what you want to bring. Now, no tail bag kit would be complete without some safety slash survival items. Now, first on the list, obviously, to me anyway, is a first aid kit. I bought this one at a backpacking store. It gets pretty much everything that you need. It's in a waterproof backpack. It's, it's sealed. It's, it's one piece unit and it's easy to see inside the bag. Now, I also keep some things like uh, a folding trail saw. There's been a couple times when you get out way back into the backwoods, maybe a hundred kilometers or so, and the trail's almost impassable because the trees fall along there. One of these small, this is a Felco, but one of these small saws could and can get you out of a pinch enough to get your sled through and carry on down the trail um, if you needed to. Uh, I always carry a knife with me. It's, it's not like I'm gonna be chased by bears and I need a knife, but a knife is a handy survival tool and uh, can get you out of a pinch. As well, I always carry some of these hand warmers, these chemical hand warmers. I carry a couple packs, so like four or five of them inside the kit. They're small, and if you're doing a field repair out in the middle of nowhere, these are great. You can shake them and get your hands warmed up. 
Uh, I carry some Kleenex with me. This is more of an emergency item in another way. You'll be thankful that you have those if you need them. Some form of fire starter. I like to carry a couple lighters with me. Just in case one fails, I just tape them together so they don't sort of float around in the pack. Some kind of, of snacks, so whether they're granola bars, beef jerky, things like that. Water is a huge thing to carry with you. Um, you can't really eat snow, so carry some water with you. It'll stay pretty much uh, thawed out inside the tail bag. And then a couple pieces of clothing. So an extra knitted hat or a toque, as we call them here in Canada and an extra pair of gloves. Now, I always ride with two pairs of uh, snowmobile gloves anyway. One is a little bit lighter, and one like this is a little bit heavier, and I'll switch those out depending on the day. But that's kind of the sort of the safety items that I carry with me uh, routinely when I ride. And let's not forget about the ultimate survival tool, money, right? So when you're snowmobiling, Credit cards are great to have, your debit card, all that kind of stuff. But you also want to carry a little bit of cash. Now, I usually carry about $100 in cash um, in different denominations. And the reason I do this is 99% of the time, uh, when you stop for fuel or you stop for food, they're going to take debit or they're going to take credit. But there are a few examples of places I've stopped that they will not take debit or credit. They, it's cash on the barrel head, basically. The one that I think of all the time is the top of the Abitibi Loop Trail near Cochrane, Ontario. Now, at the very most remote part, halfway around a, about a 300 kilometer loop, there's a place called Base Camp. And Base Camp sells basically $5 hot dogs. Uh, bags of chips it's a place to get out of the cold and warm up but they also sell fuel but the problem is they only take cash and fuel up there the last time I was up there was probably about uh, 2017 2018 maybe um, gas was four dollars a liter and it was cash only at that time now if you need fuel, if you don't have a sled that can do the full loop, you have to stop and at least get some fuel. So carrying a little bit of cash is never a bad thing. And it could even be as simple as the debit machine is down. That happens all the time around here. The more northern you go, well, you're going to end up with more potential to need cash when you're up there. So pack 100, 200 bucks in cash in your wallet, different size bills, and uh, it'll get you out of a pinch every once in a while. Now the last thing I want to talk about, but certainly not the least, is navigation. Now the advent of GPS technology has really revolutionized the way you navigate out on the woods on your snowmobile. Being able to just look down and see exactly where you are is a huge benefit that I can't sort of highlight enough in terms of how much of a change it's made even in the last decade. But whether it's a dedicated unit like this, your cell phone, or even some snowmobiles come with this technology built right in now, it is not infallible. And I always recommend carrying a paper map with you. Now I normally carry two copies of the same map. Um, one I, I keep in a plastic bag and I don't touch it just in case I need it. And the other one, I'll use that to look uh, sort of broadly over the area. The one thing I find annoying with GPS is it's sort of focused on the area where you are. And to blow that up, you're constantly deep, 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 trying to make it bigger and bigger. And even still, it's on a little screen like this. So I'll use the paper map to get a more global look at where I am. And then I'll use the GPS to sort of navigate to the points that I want to go to. Now, the other thing is these don't run out of battery. They don't break. They can get wet, but that's why I keep two. And even an outdated map like this, 2018, is still beneficial in an emergency if you need to get out of the woods or find out where you are. They have all the roads on them and you can kind of see where the towns and villages are. Now, I would also carry a compass just so you can kind of orient yourself 
and it's actually something that's fun to learn how to use in the summer before you need it. So if you've never done any orienting, it's really kind of a fun thing to do. Now, although for your first trip, you're probably not going to need a robust base camp toolkit, as you get more experienced and you start to go for multi-day trips, it's a good idea to put yourself together a really good toolkit that you can throw in your truck or in your trailer. Now, the tools that you put in here are really going to be up to you. You're obviously going to have wrenches and screwdrivers and things like that, but there's sometimes some oddball tools that I carry that you may not think about. Things like small straps, webbing straps, and I always carry a couple micro pulleys with me. This way, if I had to pull a snowmobile up onto the trailer, you can run a pulley to the front of the trailer and actually pull from outside and, and sort of get the, the uh, sled up in there. And of course, I always carry a socket set as well. Again, you can go as heavy as you want with one of these toolkits. It's really gonna be up to you to decide what comfort level you have um, when you do go away for multi-day trips. But for your first trip, you're probably not gonna need to worry about this. Well, on top of the tools that I carry, I also carry a pack out box here with some assorted items for sort of roadside emergencies. Now, the first thing that goes in here every year for me is this little guy, which is a little hard to see, but I'll, I'll pull it out and show you. But this is actually an entire hub assembly for my Triton trailer. Now, when I bought my Triton trailer, I bought it brand new from a dealer. And I asked them to, to throw in a set of bearings for one of the hubs in case the bearings fail. These small um, axles have a tendency to do that. I always used to carry a, a fresh set of bearings all packed and ready to go in case I need to change them. Well, the dealer said to me, you know, a set of bearings is $35, a hub is 70. And if you're on the side of the road in the middle of the night at minus 20, you're not fiddling around with trying to tap new races in, uh, make sure you don't lose the bearings in the snow. You basically take the old hub off, put the new one on, tighten it up, put a new a hairpin in it, and you're ready to go. I carry basically um, a lug nut set with a, with a keeper uh, grease cap on there in case I need that to help someone out or help myself out. Now, I also, in this box, keep the right size sockets for my truck, my trailer, and for other snowmobile trailers that have smaller wheels. I'm always helping people out if I can, and I keep these in this pack out box because I know where they are. I don't have to dig through my tools to get them, and they're always here. I also carry two extensions, half inch extensions, uh, a long one and a short one, and that sits in here along with my breaker bar to break the lug nuts free and then I'll use my impact gun to get the lugs off. But that sits in here as well. Now I keep a bag of nitro gloves because axles are, are nasty. I keep a few extra ratchet straps in here and a roll of shop towels. And right on the bottom I just have some cotton rags too that I can lay down and put parts on if I had to. Now, I carry a fresh roll of rope here. This is nothing fancy. This is just basic, basic rope. I think it's polyethylene. Um, but again, if I needed to pull a sled up into the trailer, I can anchor a pulley at the front of the trailer and a couple people can use the rope and pull the trailer up from outside the trailer. It works really well. Now, <clears throat> I also bring some fluids with me. I keep some chain case oil just in case I need it or someone I'm riding with does. And I also carry some 50-50 mix of antifreeze just in case one of the sleds overheats and it needs a little bit of antifreeze or if the tow vehicle needs a little bit of a top up, I keep some of that with me. And if you're still riding a two stroke, that's great. I love my two strokes. Make sure to carry yourself some oil. Now, I always ran Polaris oil when I owned Polaris at two strokes. And I always carried enough with me on the sled that I could probably have three or four fill-ups 
which is ridiculous. There's no way you could ride that far in a day, but I always carried it with me. Now, some people don't like to carry oil with them, and they'll run something like this Shell Advanced. Now, I've heard that um, it's not good to mix two-stroke oils. I don't know that if that's a myth or not, but I never mixed oils. I always ran the same oil all the time. And the nice thing about Shell Advanced, if you choose to run it, it's available at most gas stations all around up north. They seem to carry this stuff, so you can just fill your sled up, grab a liter of oil at the gas station, top it up if you need to, and not have to worry about blending different brands of two-stroke oil. So it's something to think about if you're new to snowmobiling. Um, I think the factory oils are the best, they, I really do. But I think Shell Advance is a good oil, and it's readily available if you don't really want to spend the money, especially for factory oil, which is like $50 a gallon in Canada right now. Now, the last thing that I keep in here is a uh, siphon. This is a self-starting siphon. It's got a little marble here that you shake inside the tank. It pulls the fluid up and it drops it into the other tank. If you're new to snowmobiling, there's an old saying around the old timers that say, don't pass gas. And basically, if we're running past the gas station we, and we know we're heading out on the trail, we always stop and top the sleds up. Um, I've run into more people than I can tell you that I've helped them out with fuel off of my sled with, with uh, my fuel packs than I can count on this hand. It's got to be at least six or seven different people. That my son-in-law and I have helped out over the years who didn't fill up when they had the chance. So it's a good thing to do. Uh, I'm not saying there ain't no gas being passed back at the, at the chalet, but out on the trail, you never pass gas. You always fill up your sled when you have the opportunity, unless you're pretty confident. Look, I'm just going 10 kilometers down the road to my buddy's house. Okay, that pack out's ready to go into the trailer. Snowmobiling is about preparedness as much as it is about um, having fun on the trail. And if you're new to snowmobiling, the better prepared you are, the more enjoyable your first trip's really gonna be. Now, you can kind of see me out here scraping snow off the trailers and the trucks and that. That's probably, before we even get talking about snowmobiling, uh, is probably the first thing you're gonna wanna think about. Anytime you have snow on your trailer or on your truck, you wanna get that snow off so when you get out on the highway towing to your location, that snow load isn't ending up on the car behind you. Not only is it courteous, it's the law. Now a snow brush might be okay for your truck or your, your utility vehicle, but to get on the top of some of these fully enclosed trailers, something like this snow broom is absolutely necessary. Now these are a sort of a soft foam. A lot of car dealers use these to clean cars off in the winter but I put mine onto an extendable paint stick. It gives me about 16 feet of reach with my, with my arms out, you can kind of see. And it makes it a lot easier to try and get that snow off the top of the, off the trailer, so. I always carry one of these, I just put it either in the back of the truck or in the, in the actual trailer itself. And you definitely don't want to forget about things like your marker lights over your fenders. Make sure those are cleaned off so that if you're traveling at night, which a lot of the time, you will be if you're snowmobiling at least in the early morning or late evening when you're coming home you want to make sure all your lights are uncovered and that they work so you're going to want to test all the lights on your trailer make sure the air pressure in your tires and the treads are good and that your wheel bearings have been serviced and that if they are um, like wheel buddies where you can put a bit of grease in that you've done that that you're ready to go before your trip begins. Now, I serviced all of these in the summer. I know they're good to go, but I'll still go in and check all the air pressure in both my truck tires and these, and make sure you check your spares. I always keep a full-size spare in the trailer and a full-size spare on the truck and all of the equipment to change those flats. I've had three different flats over 10 years on snowmobile trailers, and it always happens in the most inopportune place, and it is just nasty. So. If you have all the equipment, well, then you become like a NASCAR pit crew. You can change a tire and get back out on the road. And I would highly encourage, especially if you get a flat on the driver's side, try to get off the highway and into a parking lot to change those tires so you're not on the roadside in the middle of the night in a black jacket trying to change a tire. It's just a recipe for disaster. 
Part of your kit really should be having two gallons of wiper fluid. Um, and I like to store mine, for me anyway, right in behind the driver's seat where it's easy to get to. Make sure before you leave that your reservoir in your vehicle is fully topped up as well. You want as much of that window juice as you can get because sometimes the roads can just be absolutely nasty. And if you're out in the middle of nowhere heading up to Timbuktu and you don't have enough wiper fluid, you're gonna be out on the side of the highway rubbing snow on the window and no one wants to do that. Another part of that is to have really good quality wiper blades. Now I've got a set of, a set of Bosch wiper blades on here and they work really well. And you'll notice that I have the wipers lifted up. So when I go to bed at night or when I park the truck, when I arrive at the hotel, I always lift the wipers up in case you get freezing rain or so much snow that it makes it difficult to get your brush or your broom underneath. They're easy to flip down. It preserves the life of the rubber and by all means change these things as soon as they start to squeak. There's nothing more annoying than being on the highway doing, you know, 100 kilometers an hour and you have that one spot in your window that just won't get clean and it's always right in front of your face. So good wipers are always a good, good thing to have on your tow vehicle. And of course, a general service of your vehicle in the fall before the season starts is always a good idea. So get your oil changed, get your air filter serviced, make sure that all your brake fluids and your radiator coolant is up to levels before the season actually starts. There's really nothing more frustrating than having a huge dump of snow, you wanna go snowmobiling, and your vehicle lets you down. This year I had to put a battery in my 2014 GMC. It was unexpected, I couldn't believe it, but one day it just went dead. So I've got a brand new glass mat in this thing. Everything's good. I've checked the tire pressure to make sure it's nice and the tires are in good condition. I'm kind of an odd duck. I have a two wheel drive, not a four wheel drive. Um, but if you drive sensibly and you pick your time to travel, two wheel drive can actually be okay. I always buy my lock sets in sets of three and they're all keyed the same now. If you're going on an overnight trip, or even a day trip, you're going to want to lock your trailer and your truck. There are unscrupulous uh, people out there who will steal things out of your trailers if they, if they can. So, although locks are for honest people, they really can get into these if they want to. They're a bit of a deterrent and they may force people to go to a different trailer or give up altogether if they see that it's too difficult to get into your rig. You know, these things are expensive. They'll steal the trailer right off the back of your truck, if they can, with your sleds in them. So make sure everything's locked down. It's as safe as possible. And when you do get to the hotel, um, I'll sometimes park it in such a way that it'll be difficult to get the trailer off of the truck. Most uh, hotels that are out there um, understand that there is some shenanigans that do go on. So they usually have a fairly well-lit parking lot and the owners are quite um, attuned to people who shouldn't be in the parking lot and they'll get them out of there. But the best defense is to just take as many precautions as you can. Securing your snowmobile is extremely important. In Ontario, technically, it really should be tied down at both the back and the front of the sled. What this ratchet strap does at the back here is under a panic stop, it's gonna stop your sled from sliding too far forward or the back end uh, sort of wagging around. If your trailer has electric brakes, which a lot of them do, you're gonna to need to adjust the gain on the brake as you add or remove snowmobiles from your trailer. Uh, this trailer only holds two sleds um, and it doesn't have brakes, but I often will pick people up, they'll load their, tra they'll load their sled in alongside mine and you need to be aware that an extra 600 pounds in the back can affect the way your vehicle handles and the way the trailer handles. The key is preparation, making sure you have some extra ratchet straps, triple check everything, all your tow chains, um, make sure that all the lights work before you ever leave the driveway. Quite often, I'll actually load my trailer the night before and I'll stage it in the driveway so when I get up at five in the morning to head out, 
I know that everything's good. One final check on the lights, make sure everything's right, and I'm good to go. Okay, the pack out box is in, the tail bag's on, I got the, I got the truck ready. Um, really, I should talk a little bit about clothing. Now, if you've bought a new snowmobile, you've probably bought your clothing at your dealer, but there's lots of good quality snowmobile equipment available to you from different retailers. Certainly work coats like this are not active wear. They are basically a work coat. So make sure that you layer your clothing and you take a look at the weather ahead of time to know how warm you're going to have to dress. And this is what's good about a one day trip is even if you're a little bit cool or a little bit hot, you can kind of learn how your clothing and your equipment is going to operate. So I like to lay mine out the day before I ride to make sure I'm not forgetting anything. I know it sounds crazy, but I actually forgot my riding boots one trip. I had to ride in my rubber boots that I've got on right now. So do yourself a favor, just double check your equipment, make sure you're packed properly, bring a couple pairs of gloves and you should be good to go. All right, things are really looking good here. Okay, I think you're just about ready to head out there and have some fun on the trails. I'm really excited for you. Just a few closing ideas or a few closing thoughts to keep in mind. Now, if you truly are new to the sport, it's really, really beneficial to take a riding course or at the very least, make sure you're riding with some really experienced people that will teach you the trail etiquette you need to have a safe and fun trip on your new sled. It really does make it more enjoyable for you, makes it less stressful, and honestly, you won't piss anybody off if you don't know hand signals or don't know how to stay on your side of the trail. Now, riding with more experienced people can be an absolute blast. I've had the privilege to ride with a few really, really good riders. The legend's one of them, and he knows who he is out there. He's pushing 80 years old, I believe, and he's still riding, he puts thousands of kilometers on every year. And one of the things he's really good at is taking a new rider, like when I first started, and teaching them how to ride safely, not like an idiot. So find some people like that. Your local club is full of them, I know that it is. And you'll just tickle them pink to ask them how to ride right. Well, I gotta finish loading this up and hooking her up to the truck. I'm heading out tomorrow. I'm really glad you stopped by and I hope I helped a little bit and I didn't drone on so much that I'll bore you to death. But get out there, have some fun on your sled, but come on back and join me again next time here on Demo's Tinker Shed. I can't wait to ride. I'll see you soon.